My great pleasure. Uh, my great pleasure to um, introduce our speaker today. So our speaker is Harlan Weaver, who is an associate professor of social transformation studies at Kansas State University. His research and teaching center in queer and trans studies, critical race and ethnic studies, and human animal studies. They have published widely, including in GLQ, American Quarterly, and Trans Studies Quarterly. And their most recent book is the incredibly brilliant, can I just say, and here's my very well thumbed copy <laughs> of it, uh, Bad Dog, Pitbull Politics and Multispecies Justice. And the title of the seminar paper today is Bad Dog, Multispecies Justice in Pitbull Politics. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I just, I want to start by saying um, I'm normally in a position of trying to persuade non-human animal studies folks that this stuff is even relevant. <laughs> so um, having an audience that's, that's like you all is, is a real blessing and a treat. Um, so yeah, um, also for those of you who have not written books, like you don't get a say in the cover. <laughs> um, so I feel like I got really lucky with my my book, but that is not my dog, um, uh, who's a little skinnier, um, not the squat kind. Um, but um, that is the book that this is out of. Um, okay, so trigger warning. Um, some of the images that I'm gonna use are difficult. Um, I'll try and anticipate that for you. Um, and for those of folks who are coming late, there's an access to copy link that was in the chat. Um, I can redrop it if folks need it, um, if you wanna read along. So, okay, let's just start. Um, so in July of, 20, of 2007, the story broke, right? So African-American, NFL quarterback Michael Vick had been indicted on federal conspiracy charges for his role in financing and organizing a dogfighting operation. Public outcry followed, during which Vick was excoriated for his actions and even burned an effigy, um, which is, I don't know if you <laughs> think of the history of lynching in the U.S., okay? Um, so seizing on the case's high profile, animal advocates in the U.S. convinced the federal government to reverse its then typical policy regarding dogs involving fighting by permitting Vic's dogs to be evaluated and eventually rehomed. And while Vic ultimately returned to playing in the U.S. National Football League, Sports Illustrator, Illustrated writer Jim Garant's 2010 book about the case called, quote, The Lost Dogs, Michael Vick's Dogs and, the ta and Their Tale of Rescue and Redemption really underscores the problems it brought to, brought to the fore. So describing Vick, Grant posits that his strong jaw and brown eyes gave him an appearance that while handsome could fairly be described as almost canine. Can't make this up. So taking up practices such as Grant's racialization through animalization of Vic, this talk explores how contemporary discourses about dogs labeled dangerous not only reveal, but in fact emerge through changing relationships with race, class, and I will argue, gender, sexuality, and family. And in this sense, Grant's writing points to the analytic that drives my writing and thinking, right? Which I term interspecies intersectionality. So interspecies intersectionality identifies how relationships between humans and non-human animals don't just reflect, but in fact actively shape experiences of race, gender, breed, sexuality, and nation. By pairing Kimberly Crenshaw's landmark formulation of intersectionality um, with, um, which is a concept that describes how experiences of oppression such as racism and misogyny overlap and compound in ways that are inextricable and irreducible to a singular axis such as gender or race, so pairing intersectionality with interspecies, which is a term that Jasper Puar and Julie Livingston frame as, quote, referring to relationships between, between different forms of biosocial life and their political effects, close quote. I identify and analyze how the patterns so prominent in critiques like Crenshaw's emerge in and through the spaces between the relatings of humans and non-human animals. 
And while the dynamics I point to with this thinking involve an array of identities connected to both power and oppression, the most common pattern to my analysis surfaces in representations of Vic and his former dogs, racialization. So Grant's words reflect a key facet of bully breed discourses and my own focus in thinking with interspecies intersectionality, which is that pit bulls and other bullies have historically been overwhelmingly tied to black and brown working class masculinities. Um, so while race and class politics are kind of typically rendered as human specific experiences of difference, discourses involving bully breeds and a whole lot of other discourses too, right? Actually reveal kind of interspecies co-shapings, right? So the aggression and danger typically attributed to black and brown human masculinities not only emerges in and through perceptions of relationships with dogs here, right? And so we can think about how Vic's experience of black masculinity shifts because of his relationships with dogs, right? And his case, but also the reverse with bully breed dogs themselves becoming racialized as black slash brown and classed as very definitely not posh, right? Through these discourses. So, and you can think about how comparisons bring this kind of dynamic into relief. So for example, um, the elderly woman and her poodle <laughs> derided by Deleuze and Guattari and kind of becoming animal, right? Demarcates the production of a vulnerable, tacitly white, often upper-class femininity co-crafted with a typically literally white dog who is sometimes rendered as a pest, but never a danger. Or if you wanna switch up species, I. <laughs> I did not make this up. I just went on the internet and looked up crazy cat lady and this is what I got. <laughs> um, so if you wanna switch it up, you can think about what is going on with race, class and gender in the crazy cat lady tropes, right? So crucially, this isn't to say that dogs or cats themselves kind of have race in the way that Vic Garant or I could be said to have whiteness or blackness, right? So no one's doing a 23 and me or trying to like gerrymander them out of voting, right? but rather that perceptions of safety typically allocated to poodles, but refuse to bully breed dogs reveal not biology, right? But instead a kind of co-production of race, class, breed, and gender, not to mention sexuality and nation that are identifiable through the analytic of interspecies intersectionality. In the following talk, I apply interspecies intersectionality to pit bull and bully discourses in the US tracking the changes wrought by advocacy movements pre and post Vic, right? As a means to ultimately get at the question undoubtedly lingering for many of you all today, which I will frame here as what do we do in the face of the bully XL and related legislation that's pending to go into effect in 2024, right? In the UK. So my analysis combines ethnographic fieldwork in animal shelters and rescues with writings from a range of thinkers in science and technology studies, critical race and ethnic studies, queer theories, trans studies, and human animal studies. And my goal is twofold, right? So I use interspecies intersectionality to identify and analyze specific sites of human animal relatings as kind of important loci of cultural production that need to be addressed in larger projects of social change, right, rather than ignored. Um, and following this identification and analysis, I work to disrupt these connectivities, right, that thinking like Grant normalizes, right, where in bad relationships with dogs per shape perceptions and experiences of Black masculinity, for example. Through this identification and analysis, I brought in conversations of human animal studies, STS, and environmental justice focused on the kind of violences of colonialist extractive capitalism and the unquestioned dominance of, quote, man over nature, right, the Anthropocene, really by attending to spaces such as the home and the domestic. And in keeping with my training in feminist science and technology studies, my disruptions take the form of knowledge practices, specifically ways of thinking, knowing, and doing encountered in my field work that not only helped me get at the changes needed in animal shelter and rescue worlds, but also facilitate a larger imagining of what I term, in conversation with a number of STS and animal studies folks, multi-species justice. Okay, so before delving into the specific um, so I'm trying to get a look at myself here. <laughs> um, before delving into the specific pit bull and rescue dynamics that focus this talk, I want to pause for a moment 
and reflect on the history that yields connections like the ones that are so starkly exemplified in Vic's case. So put plainly, many of us are no doubt aware of how folks of color in particular are frequently tied with animality, right? So virtually any Disney film <laughs> provides disturbing evidence in this regard. Um, question for the audience, do you know what the name of the lead crow is here? Um, in case you don't, it's his name is Jim. That was Disney in what, 1941, 1942? Uh, okay, so we have long history with Disney, right? What's notable, however, in this long history, right, is kind of the several, uh, there's a several hundred years process of crafting and solidifying both the concept of race and arguably indigeneity, right, and the logics of racial and indigenous otherness so familiar today, right, which center in animality, right? So, for example, um, after dissecting the body of Satya Bartman, right, who's a Khoi Khoi woman, whose enslavement and subsequent exhibition around Europe solidified a host of perceptions regarding blackness and black femininity that really carry forward today. And look at Sabrina String's work if you wanna go dig into that, right? Um, we have French anatomist, Georges Cuvier, famously noting that um, in life, her moves had something that reminded one of the monkey and her external genitalia, which were removed from her body and displayed in jars. <laughs> in Paris, right, until their 2002 repatriation to South Africa, quote, recalled those of an orangutan, right? Then we have Josiah Knott and George Glidden's 18, we're, we're skipping over centuries here, right? <laughs> then we have Josiah Knott and George, 18, George Glidden's 1850 book, Types of Mankind, which sold out before its first printing actually to the US State Department, um, and which used images such as these um, and so here we have the kind of Apollo statue, Greek style. And then we have a pretty messed up drawing of a black man. And then we have a drawing of an ape all right on top of each other. And then we have skulls on the right side of the image, um, right? <laughs> um, and so we have these images that really work to make the case for racial difference as species difference, right? I mean, and these were polygenism, hardcore, right? Um, and so while these and many similar efforts that both precede and follow them tend to be kind of painted as standout entries in the annals of scientific racism, I wanna highlight how they actually crafted the ideas of race and racial otherness and indigeneity um, through animality, right? So claims like, former US President Trump's assertion that these people are animals regarding migrants and asylum workers to the US from Central and South America can and should be understood as an inheritance of this history made material in the present. We can also think about Netanyahu and the IDF's remarks about um, Palestinians and animality in the same vein. Okay. Um, my work aims to better understand and inherit these histories, which are both histories of violence and histories of how our ideas of difference became thinkable in the first place. And with interspecies intersectionality, I hope to begin to redress this epistemic violence that unites animality and racial otherness, right? A violence that in many ways continues to structure how we think and what we find possible to think now, right? That is our current episteme. So my turn to the present begins with bully dogs, right? So in the UK, the bully XL is about to be added to the list of banned breeds joining the Pitbull Terrier, Japanese Tosa, Dogo Argentino, and Fila Brasilero, right? However, the definitiveness of these categorizations belies what are truly stunning category, like fuzzy category problems, right? So you may or may not be aware, the Pitbull isn't a breed per se, and while the term can refer to formerly recognized dog breeds, such as American Pitbull Terrier, American Staffordshire Terrier, the American Bully, and others, generally speaking, Pitbull loosely refers to dogs between roughly 30 and 120 pounds with short hair and squat muscular bodies, right? With the Bully XL parameters, simply adding some size to what are already understood as Pitbull features um, from what I've gathered reading through the legislation. 
So perhaps reflecting this lack of definitive breed characteristics features, um, the UK Kennel Club does not recognize either pit bulls or bully XLs. And indeed, the fact that visitors to the UK had been denied entry to their dogs, even with DNA tests in hand as proof that the dog is not one of the banned breeds, really underscores the real issue here, which is that pit bull and soon bully XL identification is in the eye of the beholder <laughs> and is in fact short haired muscular dog identification, right? So if you cross a Bijla with a Mastiff, I would wager that some of those puppies will be banned by this law, right? And indeed, um, research like this, um, so this is a study of professionals who worked with animals, right? compared the DNA versus their identifications. And what we discovered is that they tended to misidentify dogs as pit bulls over, over a third of the time, right? Um, this shows that pit bulls have a category problem, right? Stunningly huge category problem, right? Um, and then we can also look at this, which is a slightly older thing that I found on the internet back in the day, findable, right? And um, so we have 25 dogs represented here. I have presented this, I can't count how many times. Um, can you identify the pit bull terrier amongst all of these? Um, no one has ever been able to, but for the record, it is number 16. Um, all of these dogs going by the, the parameters and use in most locations would be qualified as bullies. In fact, even though only one of them is actually a pit bull terrier, right? Okay. Of course, the main way that bully category problems surface is through the dog's bad reputation or what one prominent advocacy group terms their quote, bad rap. So beginning in the 1980s in the US, pit bulls were widely represented as possessed with quote, a will to kill, liable to kind of turn from harmless pet to vicious killer with no warning. Um, one result of this widespread misinformation was and continues to be the passage of what is termed breed specific legislation or BSL, which is what y'all are doing. <laughs> um, laws passed in cities, counties, and countries prohibiting or circumscribing the ownership of pit bulls and pit bull type dogs. Um, this is very widespread in the UK and the EU, right? Further, in places without bans or with kind of modified bans, um, pit bulls and bullies and animal shelters, if they wind up there, um, were and really still are routinely viewed as unadoptable, therefore leading to basically their widespread euthanasia, right? So given the fuzzy category problems noted here, it's hard not to see the many troubles engendered by the dog stigmatization, right? Um, oh, here we go. Um, I had a slide for you. <laughs> okay. Um, of course, and unsurprisingly, while bullies bad rap certainly stems from ludicrous claims of locking jaws and the like, by nature assertions seemingly delimited by the bodies of the, do the dogs themselves, and these are totally false, right? Um, it primarily emerges from the connections I just detailed earlier, right? That is this kind of widespread perception of dogs as connected to thugs, gangsters, in the US occasionally white trash. Um, along with news stories implying that, quote, rap and hip hop cultures are the real source of dog related problems, right, which brings us back to the Vic case. Okay, so here's some images that are not that great emotionally. <laughs> okay, so when the charges against Vic surfaced, people in the U.S. went into a frenzy, right, with animal advocates really excoriating Vic, right, so some graffiti that was put up. As details of neglecting, beating, and killing dogs emerged in, in the case against Vic, the dogs that had initially been characterized as, quote, some of the most aggressively trained pit bulls in the country by the head of the Humane Society, Wayne Fassell, right, that was in August, right, became victims by November, right? Then we have advocate support like this guy's, right, leading to a change in policy, such that instead of being euthanized, which is what the feds had done in all dog fighting cases prior to that point, right? So this is a real turning point here, right? The dogs were eventually released to rescue organizations. And I wanna note here, the reason that they did this actually is because they wanted to just stick Michael Vick with a bigger legal bill. They weren't actually that interested in the dog. It just, the dog's plural. Um, they just wanted to make him pay more 
Um, so the the kind of salvation, if we want to call it that, of his dogs was really more um, a vengeance kind of justice on the part of the federal government um, than any like actual interest on the dogs, which is what it is. Okay, so um, the dogs were eventually released to rescue organizations where many actually became, uh, quote, victory dogs, V-I-C-K. Um, this is Leo. Um, whose certification as canine good citizens led to labor such as offering emotional support in hospitals. So this is Leo doing his job, right? And then we have one dog, a christen Johnny Justice, who even went on to have his own gunned doll, right? This is a doll for children. Okay. Crucially, this shift, what scholar Megan Glick terms the dog's humanization, marked the individual Vic dogs as innocent and good, right? In a manner that I argue, along with cultural critic Malcolm Gladwell, really tipped the broad, broader balance of cultural perceptions of dogs characterized as pit bulls. And the why of this shift is easily identifiable through the analytic of interspecies intersectionality. Because black and brown masculinities in the US have long been stereotyped as innately violent and aggressive, Vic's dogs became innocent victims through perceptions of the threat that Vic in particular, as a black man, posed to them. Conversely, advocates routinely dehumanized Vic by arguing that he should be neutered or hung, electrocuted or drowned, right? So these are some of the images that would come up. Um, okay. So, the post-Vic pit bull landscape in the U.S. is evidenced in a remark made by my interlocutor, Cynthia, who's a white upper-class woman who divided her time between the animal shelter and her high-end retail store. She sold rugs. Okay. Um, and I think if you walk around City X now, you see a lot more people with pit bulls who look like regular people who belong in City X's neighborhoods, you know? You don't see the ghetto image, which is what used to be the case with pit bulls most of the time. So while pre-VIC advocacy efforts were often fairly deliberately framed through what I call a like race logic, um, deriding, kind of pointing to racial profiling um, and canine racism, right? Um, Cynthia's coded language reveals kind of a shift, right? So pit bulls are now separated not from folks of color per se, but rather from the quote unquote ghetto, right? Which is a space that to paraphrase geographer David Delaney, race and, and class make, right? So Cynthia's coded language and she follows this, right? So, so they're not connected to the ghetto. She follows it by placing pit bulls in connection with people that she terms regular, right? So in this sense, the regularity of the people that pit bulls are now in relationship with her Cynthia involves a tacit whiteness, as well as given how understandings of queerness tend to hinge on a failure to conform to norms and implied straightness and gender normativity. And of course, Cynthia is certainly not commenting on the many unhoused people with pit bulls who also share this cityscape um, and whose lack of access to shower facilities and basic health care de like, pretty definitively mark them outside of Cynthia's idea of regular, right? Finally, Cynthia's remark underscores the workings of race and class in pit bull worlds as they exceed individual bodies, right? For its pit bulls moves into disparate spaces and kinships, right? It's not something that's happening to the bodies of the dogs themselves, right? It's these moves into different places and different relationships, right? That shift how they're racialized and arguably how they experience class, right? This is kind of a more, it's a more than bodily material discursive shifting, right? That's, this is what's at stake with the analytic of interspecies intersectionality. Okay. So far, I have laid out a pretty dizzying array of connections involving pit bulls, category problems, the Vic case, and epistemic histories, all read through the analytic of interspecies intersectionality. However, as the Vic case and Cynthia's remarks detail, this talk is also about activism on behalf of pit bulls in the US and subsequent changes to what pit bull or bully even mean, right? And that story can't be told without attention to animal shelters in the US, which typically house, especially as you travel further southwards, um, probably about 80 to 95% pit bulls slash bully type dogs and chihuahuas um, in terms of their dog populations, right? 
And those shelters have in turn been overwhelmingly shaped by a politics that emerged in the US and elsewhere in the 1990s, right? The no-kill movement, an intervention into shelter politics promoting the eradication of euthanasia and the saving of dogs and cats, goats, roosters, et cetera, but mostly dogs uh, through really a, an adoption heavy orientation, right? So notably, no-kill advocates see their work in really striking moral terms, right? So take Nathan Winograd, who sees animal shelter in the, sheltering in the U.S. Um, <laughs> and here we have the book cover, which is kind of deserves a, a soundtrack. Um, very, very sad looking, some kind of dog, small, um, red, black, and white striking, right? Um, and he describes animal sheltering on the cover of the book right, as, quote, a movement born of compassion that lost its way. And, and then further then goes to kind of point to no-kill advocates as, quote, the heroes of a, quote, revolution that says we can and must stop the killing, right? So this is a very fervent language here. And while there is a lot more to unpack here than I have space for today, um, the popularity of this approach really radically changed the landscape of animal sheltering in the U.S. in particular, in part because injunctions towards no-kill, when met with material limits such as shelter occupancy, you know, there's only so many spaces, right, and willing adopters, right, um, led to a remarkable increase in the number of nonprofit organizations claiming to be, quote, animal rescues, right? So over 3,000% increase going by one database between the 90s and 2010s, right? And then we have that, along with the surge in both the production and claiming of human and dog identities as rescues and rescuers, right? So put plainly, what seem like common sense designations and ways of talking today, so my dog is a rescue, this is the rescue I adopted my dog from, reflect fairly recent changes in the landscape of human dog politics in the US and elsewhere. Moreover, the production of these identities involves a concomitant production of feeling or affect, right? It's where they traffic in and produce what can pretty much only be described as salvation and saviorism, right? So here I wanna divert for a moment from pitbull and bully specific thinking to share an ethnographic tale that demonstrates both the allure and the problem of no-kill style saviorism. So early in my field work, I was out for a walk with my dogs when I ran into this woman, Gretchen, right, who's a white queer woman of about 40, who's worked in animal advocacy for many years, right? She's a gruff person whose impulses to sympathy tend towards the marginalized. So think houseless pet owners, uh, communities ravaged by AIDS. Um, and Gretchen was like, she was really mad when I saw her that morning. She was frustrated and flabbergasted. Um, and she shared this story with me. So her neighbors, who are a white, straight, married, upper middle class couple, had found a chihuahua, we think, uh, wandering in the streets the day before. They had brought the dog home, not wanting to consign it to what they viewed as a kind of certain death in the life of life in the streets, right? At some point during the less than 24 hours, <laughs> um, the dog cowered when the husband swept the floor. They turned up at Gretchen's house early the next morning, convinced that the dog was one, part of a domestic violence situation, two, that it had been deliberately set loose by the victim of said violence for its protection. Therefore, it couldn't be returned to its original neighborhood, a neighborhood occupied by mostly poor folks of color and poor white folks with a small number of gentrifiers, right? And four, it couldn't be taken to a shelter, according to them, because, quote, the original, because the imagined original abuser in this wild story they concocted, right, who's clearly imagined as a man of color, might then claim the dog and use it for leverage, right? Refusing to disclose the exact location where they found the dog, they implored Gretchen to, quote, take it to a rescue where it might find a good home. So they basically stole this dog. <laughs> So Gretchen's story is remarkable for a host of reasons, right? And it's, but it details really how the production of salvation endemic to rescue discourses. And I'm putting air quotes around it because actually Gretchen is my interlocutor who is basically like, if you are not running into a burning building to grab a dog, it's not a rescue. Okay, so Gretchen's story is remarkable because we have this production of salvation and rescue discourses that really involves a concatenation or condogonation 
of race, gender, and kind of white colonialist ideals of home and family, right? Indeed, one of the few commentaries that I could find that addressed racism at all in larger discussions around dog rescue and sheltering echoes the dynamics at work in Gretchen's tale, right? So longtime shelter volunteer and blogger Nicole Dogs describes how so many of the dogs that come into rescue come from poor areas where race is always implied, but no one ever thinks to give dogs who look abused or neglected a second opinion. No matter where they came from, whoever owned them was a bad person. When we pair Nicole's observation with that of Sharon, who's a white lesbian of about 30, who works professionally as a dog behaviorist, and Sharon notes most dogs, according to most people, have been abused, we get this kind of striking connection here. For the production, production, right? Not passive reflection. Production of dogs as rescues and the concomitant narrativizing of their supposed abuse requires that dogs be rescued from someone or something. Nicole quite accurately notes how when we trace this out, claims to saving dogs entails the assumption and really production of communities of poor folks and folks of color as harmful to dogs. Further, this construction of rescue produces additional racial come class identities in the form of rescuers, right? So we can see this dynamic in Gretchen's neighbor's desire for people capable of giving dogs a good home, right? Because the ideals of home and family in the US are always already tacitly and structurally tied to whiteness and middle class aspirations. This is because the ideal of the family home, in the words of theorist Chandan Reddy, were defined, was defined by the concerted efforts of really specifically white labor movements and over the course of the 20th century in the US really over and against people of color, right? So the good home, the family home in the US is structurally speaking, a white home. Thus, the tales of rescue that pervade contemporary human animal worlds and which certainly do not involve running into burning buildings but usually adopting a dog in front of your local pet store actively produce both a white family styled salvation one and folks of color and poor people as those whom dogs need saving from. So stickers like these are neither innocent nor innocuous in that regard. So this family value style saviorism is especially striking when it comes to pit bull advocacy. While we can certainly see it in the Vic case, so one of the dogs became a children's toy, right? Um, Broader advocacy efforts, especially prior to, but especially post Vic, frequently described pit bulls as historically uh, nanny dogs, often paired with really direct claims like these, my pit bull is family. Uh, let's lick discrimination. Crucially, this moves, these moves engage kind of a troubling form of heteronormativity. So here I'm thinking with political theorist, Kathy Cohen, who famously argues that heteronormativity doesn't just police overtly gay and lesbian behaviors, right? So heteronormativity, its purview certainly includes like men not holding hands in the street, right? But it also functions more broadly, much more broadly as a white supremacist heteronormativity through the incentivization, really through the policing of reproduction, sex practices and kinship, right? So we have the incentivization of sterilization and marriage for women of color who receive governmental support or welfare. That's one of the prime examples there. And we can also think about in the US when we hear discourses of anchor babies as threats to the white population, really anything Elon Musk says can be pulled in here, right? That's the heteronormativity Cohen is pointing to, right? So in this regard, advocates moves to recuperate pit bulls through family are really movements of pit bulls into heteronormative whiteness. Thus far, I have shown you mostly troubling productions of identities and ways of being for both humans and dogs involved in pit bull politics. But mine has been a pretty US specific tracery though, right? So the UK and Europe, not to mention South and Middle America, Africa and the Middle East are all critically different in terms of the conditions of possibility for pit bulls and bullies. I think Sweden is like the one holdout, right? <laughs> um, and while the US has arguably been entering what you could call kind of a more neoliberal style dog politics, post Vic in particular, um, you know, recuperating and assimilationist kind of stuff. Um, what I see in the UK and elsewhere really seems to be leaning into what I would hesitantly categorize as really a more fascist kind of pit bull politics. So some of what I'm sharing from these US perspectives should really just be taken as cautionary tales, right? 
yes, we as in you really do need to engage in advocacy, especially with this upcoming ban, right? But ideally not of the kind of pit bull family valued variety, which leads to the truly burning question then, which is what kind of advocacy should be taken up instead? So in order to answer that question, I wanna direct our attention to challenges, to ways of thinking, to logics. As I noted earlier, the connections I identify with interspecies intersectionality emerge out of a history that structured our current way of knowing, our episteme, right? Wherein racial otherness came into conceptual being through animality. But it wasn't just racial otherness that thinkers like Cuvier, Knott, and Glidden produced, right? For their work emerged from and fed into a larger body of thought, the Enlightenment, most easily characterized by Descartes' famous claim, I think, therefore I am. That is to say, in producing racial slash animal otherness, Enlightenment thinkers and those who continued their legacy simultaneously produced the, field, the figure that yielded the metric of other from in the first place. That is the thinker who is, or who gets to be the am, right? That to be, where irrational others are not, right? Whose mind dominates his body and whose civilization in particular makes him ascendant over nature. The figure philosopher Sylvia Winter describes as rational man. Um, rational man can be thought of as kind of the like apex knower of our episteme in a way, whose idealization continues to shape what counts as valid knowledge today. So anyone who's had their ideas dismissed because they were quote too emotional or because their thinking is rooted in, for example, bodily experiences of racism and transphobia, Right? Anyone who's experienced this has experienced the policing affected by this prizing of rationality over and against feeling and bodily experience, right? This is a whole history of feminist STS in a way, right? And so the best way to really disrupt the, the dynamics I've identified with interspecies intersectionality, I'll argue, is to engage and produce different kinds of thinking and understanding that challenge this ordering of knowledge. Okay. So my first method of epistemic disruption involves what I term a sensibility. So let me explain. Dogs don't speak human in terms of literal words, words right? They're not, they're not calling up their credit card company to dispute a charge, right? Um, building good understandings of dogs requires instead, right, attention to vocalizations and movements and kind of maneuvers through space, right? To feelings expressed as bodily movements and crucially to any lack of movement, right? So utter stillness when you know what you're looking at is terrifying, right? How dogs and humans build understandings of each other emerges kind of in and through a welter of bodies, movements, affects, sensory inputs, a wide range, but especially vision, right? And while humans can't smell the way that dogs do because we're missing that secondary organ that they have in the, in those of their, in their roof of their mouth, right? Um, we frequently engage a sensibility involving a multitude of other inputs and forms of understanding that at their core decenter the human as prime knower and instead prioritize knowledges that emerge through the space between human and dog. So this is I'm arguing that there's a sensibility that needs to be engaged with relating with dogs in particular. So there are a lot of examples of the sensibility. Um, today I'm going to give you two. The first is this work by artist Lily Chin. So Chen's really beautiful illustrations here, a range of bodily positions and movements that are at once emotional indicators, facilitate better and more accurate human perceptions of dogs' bodies and their language, right? And their language is plural, arguably. Chen's drawings interpolate viewers into a way of knowing attuned to how dogs themselves build understandings, which is a distinctly non-anthropomorphic sensibility. My second example is more of an observation. So many people who live with dogs can attest that a key facet of life together is the rearrangement of the domestic. So this can take the form of protecting furniture from paws, not being allowed to go to the bathroom by yourself, or as dogs age, organizing living spaces to accommodate not just shorter legs, but arthritis, right? These rearrangements enact a way of understanding and building place attuned to non-human animal needs, a sensibility. And then there are the non-human engineered rearrangements as pictured here, which also rearrange and disrupt the domestic. Okay, so both Chin's arts and artwork, right? And you should really, her book is amazing. If y'all, she has a little 
I call it doggy drawings, doggy body language book. Great Christmas present, coffee table gift, um, especially for folks with small children. Okay, so both Chin's art and these reorderings of the domestic work through sensibility as an attention to the sensory that builds and affirms different kinds of knowledges and connections between humans and dogs. Right, so this kind of sensible production here. While these examples certainly fit well within a larger landscape of family homes and scaled up in the US at least a kind of settler colonial spatial order imposed on stolen land, right? Settler colonialism is a structure, not an event here, so we're sticking around. Um, I argue that they in fact stray from those spaces and logics nonetheless, right? And this is because the attunement to disparities in sensory perceptions and bodily experiences required by the sensibility yields connections that are not or that are quite, are not quite about family or kinship or a larger normative geography. So being able to tell the differences among nervous, fearful, and happy dog body language makes people much less likely, for example, to really let their, their child hug a dog when it appears the dog has had enough, right? We have that here. Um, and then we have the many beaches, breaches to spatial organization and expectations that dogs and cats produce in living spaces, which really run counter to what we might call proper. So um, most folks are not okay with the roommate supervising them in the bathroom, right? But our pets do it all the time. So the understandings produced by the sensibility that I'm delineating here build connections that I call queer affiliations, right? For they produce ways of relating affiliations that stray from white supremacist heteronormative ideals, of kinship, family, and home, right? These are connections that may be happening within these spaces, but that involve this kind of vulnerability and attunement that are not part of a larger, let's see, heteropatriarchal social order. Okay, further, these queer affiliations really decenter the human and push against anthropocentric racist epistemes, right? By claiming and foregrounding the ways of knowing that emerge in and through body, bodies, bodily senses, and relationships between humans and non-human animals. However, while this sensibility and its affiliations promise different ways of knowing and relating, they really don't directly challenge the unrest, like the, the major problems of our social order right now, right? Um, and, you know, many folks who are actually really good at building accurate bodily understandings of dogs are also unquestioningly devoted to rescuing pit bulls by placing them with rich white families, right? So this sensibility isn't necessarily all that disruptive. And so that's why I pair it with an additional epistemic intervention. So here I turn to the words of one of my interlocutors, Nathan, who's a white queer man in his late 20s with extensive experience working in animal shelters. Nathan had just told me this pretty appalling story about how these like kind of self-proclaimed animal rescuers at his shelter had showed up and tried to take a video of a dog for publicity reasons um, and basically traumatized it like pretty extensively, ignoring its clear expressions of fear and whatnot. Um, and it, I think they ultimately just had to put the dog back in the kennel and the dog was like, never again. Um, Nathan then observed to me that the shelter volunteers most likely to engage in those kinds of practices. So endeavors that we might term insensible to the dogs in question, right? We're also those who are the most likely to sport kind of all live matter shirts and similar paraphernalia. That is the people who lacked the sensibility I described here we're also the most likely to engage in racist political messaging. And when I asked him what he did, if stuff like, if that kind of stuff kind of came up with any of the fellow shelter staff, right? He responded, it doesn't happen as much. And I think that's mostly because the group of people that I work with um, who tend to have some of the same awareness. So in this reference to awareness, Nathan expresses a sensitivity in keeping with the bodily sensibility I outlined and an acknowledgement of the structures of racism, classism, colonialism, misogyny, heteronormativity, and transphobia in which shelter worlds and rescue practices are emplaced. This awareness engages the affective sensitive, sensory kind of curiosity and vulnerability of sensibility, right? And joins it with an attention to the intersecting oppressions and modes of power, interspecies and otherwise, that shape bodies and all too often police and marginalize them. This awareness attends to the, dy the dynamics I have detailed throughout this talk, 
through the lens of interspecies intersectionality and paired with sensibility provides the basis for fairly large scale disruptions. Okay, so as I have detailed today, a key facet to the production of pit bulls as kind of good rather than bad dogs in the US today lies in claims to and the material labors of rescue in the wake of the Vic case. But the saviorism of rescue obscures the fact that humans and dogs against marginalization and structural harms together, right? The dynamics that lead people to, for example, surrender their dog to a shelter or fail to repair holes and fences through which the dogs escape, right? And become strays and then end up in the shelter, right? Those are the same dynamics that harm those people as humans, right? So it's lack of affordable housing, pervasive racism, ableism, and misogyny that prevent a living wage, right? Um, which is also one of those white dominant structures. Um, structural violences that produce food insecurity, health problems, what have you, right? And then we have the dynamics that lead to dog bites, right? Which often stem from not only those same structural violences, but also the related issue which is perhaps itself also a structural violence, which is that it is prohibitively expensive to access, if possible at all, the expertise of a trainer or behaviorist who could help teach folks how to anticipate and prevent problem behaviors, right? Because dogs don't ever bite without giving warning, right? But finding access to someone who can teach you how to read when that's gonna happen, that's really hard, right? And expensive. And so here's where Nathan's awareness comes to bear. For attention to how these dynamics bolster some human animal relatings while making others impossible or unsustainable yields a very different intervention than a kind of move to rescue, right? So here I wanna quote another interlocutor, Kayla, who's a white straight woman in her 50s with extensive experience in animal rescuing, who details what is perhaps the biggest change in approach that stems from this awareness. We need to be doing more work pre preventing shelter animals from happening. Okay, so efforts to prevent shelter animals from happening pair sensibility and awareness in an array of forms, right? So among those already in existence, if not widely, are the provision of free and low cost veterinary care, free and low cost behavioral and training help, funding to help people build or fix fences, efforts to make it so houseless folks can keep their pets. Um, and just small side note here, um, thinking about what would dogs want, dogs are much happier living with houseless folks than they are living at home alone most of the time, right? So thinking about dog desires and the metric of dog desires as something that's gonna determine what they think is justice is something I'm trying to go for here, right? Um, so working to help folks keep their pets, right? Houseless folks included, um, working to accommodate humans and pets in a range of shelter and refuge spaces, especially including domestic violence shelters. So about 40% of people don't leave domestic violence situations because they're worried about their animals. Um, so having those sites have the capacity to house humans and non-human animals is like what we need, um, right? So um, making animal shelters a space that aren't just, you know, paying fines and basically doing more structural violence, right? would be another thing, right? So all of these combine varying degrees of attention to dogs' bodies and desires with moves to counter larger structural violences that make some human dogs relating relatings less possible than others. However, while work to prevent shelter animals from happening interrupts saviorism, which is certainly a big key piece in here, right? is not quite the tool for addressing breed specific legislation or the UK's forthcoming, what I'm gonna call the augmented pit bull plan because all they're doing is adding size to an already existing fuzzy. Um, so here's where another join of sensibility and awareness is called for, right? So as we know, BSL is animated by a very real fear of dog bites, right? Which is a persistent public health issue that in terms of data has very little to do with breed right? There's no breed specific data. Um, and mainly this is because of the category problems, right? We don't know what kinds of dogs are actually doing the biting because what we're getting is misidentification run rampant, right? Um, so we have that going on, right? BSL attempts to redress this fear about dog fights by incorrectly localizing danger and a determination of breed so overwhelmingly fuzzy that the eye of the beholder trumps literal genetics, right? So this is not workable, right? However, the fix for this is in at least one sense, wildly simple, right? 
We teach people how to read and understand dog body language so that they can anticipate whether and how a dog will act based on its behavior and body language, right? Not its proximity to an incredibly vague phenotype. We could add dog, possibly cat and other domestic animal, right? Ethology materials to primary school curricula. Or we could offer free classes on dog slash animal body language in animal shelters, right? If we mainstream the basics of accurately seeing what a dog is saying so that folks come to accurately read dogs' bodies for fear as well as happiness, right? So no wagging tails are not always a good thing, right? Then if someone thinks a dog is a problem, they need to submit a report based on how it acts, not how it looks or not, or if we're being real here, who owns it, right? This one move would arguably help people of all backgrounds both better understand and build more positive relationships with non-human animals, especially with those with the capacity for harm, right? Because when you've learned about how dogs think and communicate, you're much less likely to offer to grab the collar of a strange dog, which no one should do, um, who is giving very clear signs that it doesn't want to be touched by you. And I'm citing this in particular because I'm thinking of the video of the bully XL that happened in the tube right? That dog did not want to be touched, right? And certainly not near its face, right? Basic dog knowledge would have prevented that situation. So a step like this kind of educational stuff, right, would move the UK away from practices of kind of inaccurately claiming to identify, quote, dangerous dog its looks and towards being able to accurately identify a dangerous dog by its behavior, right? Legible in its body language. Right. And crucially, such a step would materially facilitate the actual goal here, which is preventing dog bites and related incidents, and which BSL has been very conclusively shown not to do. Okay. So throughout this talk, I've used the analytic of interspecies intersectionality to highlight troubling connections in pit bull and rescue worlds that reinforce dynamics of oppression. My analysis has foregrounded how these connections emerge out of an epistemic history and present that has produced kind of both the figure of rational man as apex knower and the racial animal other, right? By introducing alternate ways of knowing and building understanding and the pairing of sensibility and awareness, I've detailed both existing and potential challenges to these connections and episteme. In closing, I want to point to an additional re resonance between my thinking and contemporary social justice projects, specifically those of transformative and restorative justice. So transformative and restorative justice aim to heal communities, right? Turning away from punishment and vengeance as justice, right? And really reconceptualizing justice as a world where police and prisons don't exist for starters and what it would take to build that. Right? Theirs is a justice that nurtures, a justice that inherits histories of violence and marginalization rather than disavows them, right? A justice that brings communities together rather than tearing them apart. And applying interspecies intersectionality to pit bull and bully worlds today, I've identified numerous sites of multi-species injustice, right? While the labors that I've pointed towards really work towards repairing these, right? So engaging sensibility and awareness through practices like providing free veterinary care, standardizing education and dog ethology, um, and ensuring domestic violence shelters include trans folks and pets and their remit, right? These all reduce violences experienced by humans and animals together, right? And thereby, right, so st facilitate sustainable multi-species flourishing instead. These are formations of multi-species justice. However, and here's where I'll leave us, because with justice, I want to go further. I want to lean in and ask for more, right? And that is, I want, I want reparations, right? And this is because of what I've witnessed, right? So one of the shelters I volunteered at used to have, and, and I'm not exaggerating, used to have stacks of dead pit bulls and bullies stacked around the back door every Friday, right? which was the day they euthanized in which they did weekly due to space limitations. And then they had really restrictive read adoption policies. So you had to be able to, you basically had to own your house to be able to adopt a pit bull or bully type dog or have a lease that explicitly stated that you could have a pit bull or bully type dog, which is basically impossible for most people, right? So those dogs couldn't get adopted for the most part. And so that's why they were getting euthanized, right? Once I surrendered a dog, I found walking around, wandering around my, my neighborhood, right, which was, that was the municipal remit, right, um, to that same shelter and was told 
<laughs> that only the best of the best pit bulls go up for adoption there by an animal control officer who claimed to have administered a temperament test and who would not have recognized friendly or unfriendly dog body language if that tail hit him in the face. Um, these practices of kind of math euthanasia and whatnot, um, and we can get into the dynamics of temperament testing if you want, right, are fairly typical in the US today, in spite of the activisms that I've detailed here, right? So, and that's just, that's just a lot of dead dogs, right? Most of them for the wrong reasons, right? And the dynamics that unalive these dogs are very widespread, in large part because of the ties among breed-specific legislation, gender, class, and racialization I've detailed today. And so, while multi-species reparations in terms of the larger landscape of rescues and shelters really just feels like impossible to imagine, <laughs> I do think that we should start to imagine the multi-species reparations for pit bulls and bull leagues. And because dogs don't exactly engage directly in capitalism, you can't like Venmo them, like, sorry, buddy. Um, we can't rewind time. Um, we can't apparently change the minds of DEFRA appointees um, in the UK. Um, while multi-species reparations would certainly involve the repeal of breed-specific legislation, as a means to get there, they should take the form of the free education and behavioral health that I've detailed here, right? If we give folks the tools to pick up the sensibility that I'm describing here, we'll have far less dangerous dogs going forward and we'll have them without feeding into the kind of messed up race and class imaginary the way the US based advocates have done, right? I mean, like, oh no, they're just like family. Like pit bulls aren't associated with black brown masculinities. They're associated with happy white heteronormative homes, right? Okay, and if we give folks the tools of this sensibility, right? Not only will we have less bad dogs, but dogs will have less bad humans. And for me, that really feels kind of akin to justice and possibly, hopefully, repair. And that is what I have for you today. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, absolutely fantastic and fascinating. Um, paper Holland um we've got time for some questions if anybody would like to um ask I'll open it up now for questions if people would like to switch their cameras on as well um so that Holland can see that it's not just the two of us <laughs> there we go thanks Richard <laughs> and there's more people out there um any any questions I mean I've Certainly, have some questions. Um, I give anybody else the opportunity first. Okay. Um, right. So, um, yeah. So, um, Holland. I mean, I'm I'm really fascinated by the parallels um, that there are between the UK situation and. Um, the US situation when it comes yeah, to Yeah, I had to claim I changed up my talk entirely. I was like, we're in like a different timescape almost here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are there's there are a number of parallels. The thing that's that is different in the UK situation is that um the the discourse and the narrative around um around dangerous dogs isn't racialized in the same way as it is um in in the u.s at the moment but um I, i'm i'm really interested oh, okay wait hold on though yeah because i disagree with that okay um so i think the way that we talk so <laughs> i disagree with all of europe in a lot of ways because well, many of the many times i've been to europe i feel like europeans are like are Euro u.s americans are racist we're not and that is that is such a falsehood um, and I think, you know, one of the things to think about is the language of racialization is not just for folks of color, right? So the language of racialization involves whiteness too and the production of whiteness. Um, and I think what happens in Europe is that it gets routed through migration and Islamophobia in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and I think folks in the US would look at it and call it race, but it's not race because it's not happening through this, you know, it's not happening through the same kind of production of bodily legibilities. Um, but it is very, very much there nonetheless. Like, um, so I know that y'all think that it's about class and not race. I would argue that it's both. 
Yeah, that's I mean, um, that's that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I suppose um, I'm interested. Um, I'd be interested to kind of hear you sort of expand on that a little more because yeah, I think um, certainly um, we we do see a lot of the the narrative around um, around dangerous dogs is certainly revolving around um, working class. Um, practices it's certainly um a, you know a, a, there's there's no doubt that there's a class discourse there and it's been made really really clear um and um and there's the lurchers and stuff and then there's the death of the carrier pigeons right <laughs> you know like, i mean it's, there's you know even, even the um the, the home secretary that introduced breed specific legislation into the uk admitted um the a couple of years after its introduction actually admitted that it was a it was a class uh, it was based on class and and he actually said that he didn't want to offend the middle classes so um the pit bull owners were just an easy target and he he talks about the fact that um they were they were an easy target because they had tattoos and wore earrings so they were you know seen, yeah. Seen, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Um, and then there's um, there's a really interesting comparison that he makes where there's a, there's a part which is of... a really interesting remark about masculinities there absolutely right? <laughs> like, there's... tied to types of masculinities certainly types of working class masculinities and um, there's a really interesting comment um, that's made during the parliamentary debate on how to identify uh, this is just before bringing in breed specific legislation in the UK how they should mm -hmm. identify the pit bulls. And the MPs are actually joking about the fact that um, maybe the pit bulls would have love and hate tattooed on their knuckles, the same as their owners did. There's, yeah, it's, it, 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 it there's, there's no doubt at all that, you know, it's very much um, revolves around sort of the, the working class masculinities, but I'm, I'm really interested to hear if you have another observation about that. And, you know, if, if you do see that there's um, a more kind of, you know, a racialized discourse that's, that's intervening there as well with that, that, that very kind of, you know, folk, that very much that focus on, on working class masculinities in the UK. I mean, so I think, I think the dynamics that like, it's interesting, like, I think the dynamics are wildly some like, yeah. this is about policing and producing particular kinds of masculinity or making them less possible through the bodies of dogs. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think like, um, whether we attribute it to, like getting intersectional, if we attribute it to race and class, right, including, you know, like this is a production of working class whiteness as problematic. That's racialized. OK, mm -hmm. um, so like. Yes, and like the interventions that follow from that, and this is where the U.S., I think, provides some really interesting lessons, right, is to be like, OK, because what, you know, the kind of gay marriage style, like, move that y'all would, that that we did, right, is to be like, oh, no, pit bulls are part of family values. You know, pit bulls are family. Um, we need to visibly and visually through multiple material. I mean, the Vic dogs, you know, mm -hmm. they were publicity machines, right? You know, so we need to visibly and visibly, like, visually distribute images of dogs being good with, with, white folks being productive, healthy, happy citizens, right? You know, like there's like the canine good citizen certificate is like part of what, you know, was going on with the Vic Dogs in particular. Um, so I think, I think the dynamics are <laughs> like, you can't make it up, right? They're, they're so easy to identify, right? The question is what do you do with those, right? And so if you're not going to be like, Ideally, if you're not going to do the kind of assimilationist move instead, right, and be like, no, 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 these dogs aren't associated, these dogs don't need tattoos because they live with people who get, you know, like butterfly tattoos, you know, on you know, their back or something, right, not thug life tattoos on their knuckles, right, um, 
that's 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 still feeding into the same discourses right Mm -hmm. you know because they're still being rescued from right you know it's that's that kind of like rescued from detached from these spaces move to these spaces move so Mm -hmm. the so the thing would be like well how do you build a robust advocacy movement that isn't just kind of like gay marriage assimilationist style politics right like how do you build a robust advocacy movement that's actually going to solve the real problem which is dog bites Mm. right and how you do that is by teaching people how to read dog body language which has nothing you know which varies a little bit across breeds you know like huskies look a little different you know than boxers when they play for example right um but like should be in people's repertoire anyway you know like people should know this you know Mm -hmm. like it shouldn't be rocket science to be like oh i'm not gonna grab that dog because that dog is giving me whale eye hardcore Mm -hmm. and like the last thing you want to do with the dog giving you whale eye is to go in next to its face right like that's just that's silly so so i would say um i think you're absolutely right that those dynamics are like offensively just Mm -hmm. widespread right um, the question is what you do about them and how do you redress them without necessarily kind of feeding into the the other part of them that's just going to retrench that, right? Um, yeah. So. yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting because when you were talking about um, the um, being able to identify dog body language, um, we uh, we did we did a survey to look at people's understanding of dog body language and also dog risk as well and it was really and also um being able to identify pit bulls um and so this this will not surprise you at all so um when we presented uh we surveyed just over 1500 people and we asked them to identify well we asked them first how confident are you in identifying a pit bull. And of course, everybody was incredibly confident and they said, yes, they could identify a pit bull. Um, But when we actually asked them to identify from, um, we were just giving them six pictures. So not even the sort of 22 or 16 range, we gave them six pictures. Two Mm -hmm. of the pit bulls, only 2% of our respondents would identify both pit bulls. Um, Yeah. So, and again, that, that study that I pointed to, they did it initially with just still images and then they went back and did it yeah. with video. Same results. Same result. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And and I think that 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 really does highlight the, the, the problems with this idea of breed specific legislation in the first place and the types of dogs who are caught within this trap of this kind of awful fuzzy categorization. Um, but it was interesting when you were saying about dog body language, because, again, we mm-hmm. asked to uh, look at look at still images this is what's so important yeah language and apart from being able to identify really obvious things like a, a proper growl like a proper snarl an image of a proper snarl and a play bow uh-huh. tense body language they couldn't people couldn't recognize i mean like if you're not watching the commissars you know yeah. like is it a fear grimace or is it a growl you know that's the main one yeah. you know like if you don't know you have to be able to see how much teeth is happening yeah. right to be able to accurately identify whether this is fear or or aggression or play you yeah. know but people didn't understand yeah. Well, ear placement, you know, tense jaws and things like that, you know, so a stiff upright tail, that is a warning sign. Yeah. <laughs> right? And everybody's like, oh, it's wagging. Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 stay the fuck away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's 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 absolutely vital that 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 becomes a key part of what happens because it's really clear. I mean, just from the work that we did that, you know, the um people's ability to recognize what dogs are trying to say to them really clearly dogs are saying it really clearly and we can't see it clearly and they're doing it like they they never do it without warning you know so you know i think a key part of these discourses is that kind of like flip you know like you know like unexpected part you know that's that's a real locus of fear there and it's like I have never seen a dog bite without giving like five signs that it's going to you know like ever like you know, but if you don't know what you're looking for, then yeah, you're going to be taken by surprise. I'm, I was one of the things that I did want to ask you about, and I'm really sorry, anybody who wants to butt in with a question, please do, because uh, <laughs> I could talk about this for a long time. Um, there was one thing I did want to ask you about. So, um, some of the statistics that we have at the moment around mm-hmm. 
the geographic dispersal of dog bites shows mm -hmm. the largest number of dog bites happen um, in economically deprived, the most economically deprived areas. And I was really interested in sort of how um, how you would sort of maybe like reflect on that kind of. Um, oh, yeah, I haven't. Yeah, that's, that's how, not that yeah, hard what, to. What yeah. Because, you know, there is an issue, obviously, with that kind of that kind of statistic, because it starts to suggest that that working class people essentially have no control over their dogs or they have the out of control dogs. So there's a real problem there with the way that that can be. Um, taken. Right. And I mean, the real problem is life under capitalism, yeah. right? You know, like people who get complaints about their dogs, whose dogs bite, you know, it's because they go and work 12 hour days and their dogs are stuck at home the whole time. Right. You know, so a dog socialization window is between three and five months. Right during which time you're supposed to expose it to ideally 100 plus different size people, different movement people, different ages people, different colors people, right? And 100 plus different size ages movements dogs, right? Mm -hmm. um, economics overwhelmingly shaped the possibility of the, the conditions of possibility of that kind of socialization, right? Um, can you take your dog to a space where it can freely meet other dogs off leash, you know, which is, you know, with supervisors who can identify, oh, this is a problem behavior needs to be interrupted. This is not right. You know, those like puppy socialization classes, right? Um, but you like, can you pay to fix your fence, right? If your dog is getting out, um, can you pay for a trainer if your dog has bitten someone in the home, right? Because are there free training resources? I don't know of any country that has free training resources. And yet, um, you know, and I think especially with the pandemic, right, we had a lot of folks adopting dogs who, um, who have separation anxiety, for example, right, which is a phenomenally difficult problem to work with. If you cannot leave your dog alone for more than like a minute, like um, you're spending thousands of dollars, right, slash however many pounds that is, I feel like the rate keeps shifting, but here we are, um, right? You know, it's, it's just wildly expensive, right? And so if those are not options available to you and you are trying to like kind of make it work, leaning through family and friend like networks who like probably watch Caesar Milan, right? And who think that the way that you deal with a dog who's misbehaving is by hitting it, right? Or threatening it, right? which is just going to make that behavior so much worse, right? So so I think, you know, it's life under capitalism here that's making, that's making it less possible for folks to be able to interact with their dogs and be able to, like, work with their dogs in healthy and constructive ways, um, right? Because they're working so much, right? Um, and because support networks, you know, are varied and uneven, right? Mm -hmm. But do have a lot to do with especially class, right? You know, um, you know, like my best friend has a dog with separation anxiety, you know, and they have two dog sitters, you know, and it's just like, it's the kind of thing where like, I wouldn't have adopted the dog, you know, <laughs> like period, you know, but you have so many folks who don't know that that's even a problem to worry about, right? So I think you also have this problem where you have a lot of folks going into adoptions, getting dogs with these massively intense behavioral problems. And there's a timing, there's a temporality to it that I go into in the book. Um, I'm kind of taking up dogs that have been at the shelter for like a very long time who are already pretty messed up in the head, right? You know, and then being like, and then trying to socialize them. But the thing is the socialization window is between three and five months, right? So anything you're doing after that point is no longer technically socialization, right? Um, you know, trying to remedy any of those kind of like bad associations the dog has with various kinds of people or dogs, right? Like you're, you're playing catch up at that point. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're probably especially if you've been watching like Caesar Milan at all, you know, like you're just going to make it worse. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I, I can see Martha's raised a hand. I can, I just make it just a very, very quick comment on the Caesar Milan issue. Uh, when we, <laughs> when we said the same, same 1500 people and we asked them, where do they get the majority of their information? Oh, this is 1500 people. Yeah, 15, oh, wow. Oh, okay. Uh, wow. Asked, where do you get your information from about dogs? Um, and they told us TV and we asked them which television programs, and of course the top. There's Victoria Stillwell, um, right? But, of course, it's Caesar yeah. Milan. So, I mean, for people who don't know Caesar Milan and 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 the other program that they they referred to, 
they're um they they use very um they use these kind of dominance theory. I know there's basically like a war going on in dog training worlds where you have on the one side basically folks who are all positive reinforcement um Victoria Stillwell you can art like this really started with Karen Pryor who kind of came over from marine mammal training worlds into dog worlds and that's where we got clicker training right in the early 1980s that has since been picked up by a like range of folks and then you have folks like Caesar Milan um who um are doing more like a folk science you could say um and who are very into you know who are very into kind of a dominance narrative that has been eschewed by like the language of alpha beta etc you know came out of wolf research on captive wolves that has since been rescinded like retracted by the very people who wrote it right so like Yes. Yeah. Anyways, there's so much buried in there. <laughs> Bartha, what were you going to say? But in the UK, that's where that's where most people are getting their information from. So that explains right. a lot as well. So I'll, right. I'll, pass over. I'll let Martha ask, <laughs> ask a question. Sorry, Martha. No, no, thank you. This has been such an interesting discussion. And thank you, Harlan, for that terrific presentation. Um, I can't wait to read your book. Uh, it's on my my Christmas list now. Um, but I just I had a, a question because I've just written um, a paper on more than human um, intersectionality. And um, mm -hmm. what I was really curious about is your incorporation of nation. And if you could say mm -hmm. a little bit more about that, because. Oh, because colonialism. It, because of colonialism. And so was there any kind of pushback about, well, that's not normally, you know, included in intersectional. OK. So, so, yeah, I mean, like, so, I mean, so there's Jennifer Nash, Jennifer Nash is writing on, on Crenshaw is helpful here. Um, and the book is out. Um, but, um, you know, because Crenshaw is going to give you the argument and like still does, if you look at her TED talk now, you know, for example, my talk to my students about this, actually, because in her TED talk now, it's still about gender and race, but she has these images of folks that like, to all of the viewers that I have talked with about it look like folks who are gender nonconforming, right? Who like, who would probably, who I would imagine at least some of them claim transness, right? You know, so there's intersectionality as formulated by Crenshaw and then there's intersectionality as an idea that has traveled beyond Crenshaw that she doesn't get to police anymore, right? Um, and so in terms of nation, I mean, so, so I've done like, we can move outside of dogs pretty easily here. Um, you know, think about Japan and whale meat, right? And the kind of construction of Japanese-ness through whale meat provision, right? Um, there's obviously a lot of stuff going on with settler colonialism, which is where I think mostly about nation, right? You know, like, like I'm on stolen land here, you know? Um, and so there's, it's always a production of nation right, in the nation state. You know, you know, like an animal shelter is a shelter that's under the aegis of the U.S. government. And, you know, especially if we think about kind of indigenous activisms, which are really about like they're not about getting rights from any federal governments because they want their own governments. Right. Um, and so thinking about disrupting, you know, those you know, like, so, so indigenous nations, you know, are not trying to appeal to the feds because they want the feds to leave them the fuck alone, you know, <laughs> like, and build their, you know, be sovereign. Right. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm, I have ADHD and I, I'm trying to, oh, oh, Spain. Interesting. Um, I'm interested because Spain is, you know, so I have, so I've never applied to a fellowship in the UK, by the way, because I, which I, I feel like I could have gotten, I was a strong candidate for a number of them, but because of this law, right. I have never applied to it. Like I didn't apply to any fellowships and Canada either for the same reason, right? Um, because I couldn't bring my pet pit bull. The only places that I have done fellowships are in Sweden, right? Where pit bulls are legal. Um, I didn't bring my dog though. <laughs> but um, but I mean these you're kind of not seeing the people that are not coming to the UK, right? Because of this, you know, like is one thing to go to go with here. Um, but in terms of Spain, um, I honestly think like a compulsory like learn how to like treat dogs education thing is, is exactly the idea um the problem the where it gets thorny um is is the training wars right and is the wars around like what is the right way to deal with problem behaviors right so like a standardized education that was also 
positive reinforcement oriented, right? That's what I would, I think is amazing, right? And what we should go for. If it's a standardized education where they're like, put a prong collar on your dog when it pulls on the leash, like then obviously then no, right? <laughs> that's and i know that those are illegal in the uk but they are very legal in the us so yeah uh richard you were gonna yeah thanks Caroline. um i'm really interested actually in the discussion there on intersectionality it's uh, uh something i've been interested in and the sort of um the crenshaw and the and the alternative kind of lineage mm -hmm. um, and i kind of see in in the history of feminist thought you've got uh crenshaw and and related um theorists and then you've also got the kind of um less cited ecofeminist work which did make a point of focusing on animalization and that that then fed into animal studies and critical animal studies and it's really interesting that um still when you read books like texts on intersectionality they're not really talking about animals at all they, they just like you know they don't even engage with um animalization but it is really interesting and i noticed this in um a recent thing that i that i did a talk for the um australia australasian animal studies association which i'm going to get published soon and i, I went back yeah. to crenshaw's 1991 classic mapping the margins uh paper which has been cited over thirty one thousand times and uh, <laughs> there's there's a food note in in that um paper which uh is actually um registering her um disagreement with the way in which black men are being animalized in the context of um rape cases in new york central park and uh, oh yeah and she so said you mean the, the case that president trump published a, a full page ad in I think the right. new york yeah. times about yeah yeah uh, so yeah. so basically crenshaw is critical of the portrayal of black men at the time as bestial savage mm -hmm and as constituting an, in quote, wolf pack. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously she was critical yeah. for that because of the way, the way in which it was inflaming the general cultural portrayal of black men at the time. But it's just it's just in a footnote and there's not any sort of um, development. She doesn't have any skin in the game when it comes to black masculinity is really, you know, like she's really focusing on gender as woman, you know, which is one of the critiques that gets leveraged against intersectionality, right? right? Yeah, yeah, sounds, sounds fair, yeah. <laughs> but um I mean I think I think what's helpful uh Sarah Lamble who is a UK person um has a piece that's either on it's it's in one of two articles where they they basically point to another piece another Gail Mason writing about how if you take like how how these kind of different identity categories are actually vehicles of articulation for each other as another way to kind of think through how the how of intersectionality um you know so if you were to take like identical pictures of like two men one in like a blue checked shirt and one in a red checked shirt but they're both kind of burly bearded whatever if you tell the your viewer that one of those guys is gay and one of them isn't most of the time they won't consciously admit to it though but most of the time that that guy who's gay is going to be read as less masculine even though they're identical right so thinking about how how these work through in and through each other right um and then really taking up jennifer nash's in, in, intervention and being like look we can run with intersectionality and like you need to always talk about race generally when you're going to be using it but like it, it needs to be a much more expansive analytic than you know that kind of slippage between intersectionality to black feminism to black women which again jennifer nash really beautifully elucidates in like the first chapter of her book so great can you talk um, of, of that other theorist that you mentioned at the beginning yeah yeah jennifer nash um well, the other one that you mentioned i think you said it was a british based um oh okay yeah i mean sarah lamble um it's either queer necropolitics or it's a piece on can say of remembrance. Great, thanks. But she's that they're referring to um like a kind of violence, interpersonal violence kind of writer, Gail Mason, who I actually didn't go back and read because I was like, I'm I'm good with this quote. So <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, in the, I mean, the reason, because I get a lot of pushback of, you know, why didn't I use as assemblage, you know? Um, and I think the reason for me is, is actually because of those eco-feminist thinkers and because of the many, many papers that I've, I do a lot of article reviewing, you know, um, and there's just like all of this work in animal studies and especially all the stuff that's like ultimately about veganism, like does not talk about race or class at all. And so it talks about gender, but it talks about gender in a way that's tacitly white and middle class, right? You know, that's like, it's in its unmarkedness is actually marked as racialized in that particular way and as class in that particular way, right? Um, and so that's, you know, really where like, like the eco-feminist stuff, you know, like is, is valid when you're talking about gender in terms of whiteness, right? Um, is not particularly valid when we're talking about kind of what Maria Lugones terms kind of that production of like light and dark genders, right? You know, so we have a gender formation that's available to white folks, right? And then we have a gender formation that has been produced in a, and really produced in and through and for folks of color, you know, where you can be female, but you can't be woman, right? Um, you know, and this is a legacy of chattel slavery, but I mean, it comes up linguistically um, all the time now, right? Um, and that kind of denial of humanity through kind of being like, oh, you can, we can use the same language we use for non-human animals, right? You're female or you're male, right? But you're not man or woman here. Um, that's where I'm going to end that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we've we've actually that's a really that's a really good good point too, and um because we have actually run out of time, um. So I want to just formally thank Harlan again for an amazing paper, fantastic. It's certainly given me a, a lot to think about as well. So thank you so much. Um, as your book did, which which was just you know it was it was great, and I would urge everybody to go out and buy this book um and get it get it on your get it on your list at Christmas if you haven't done all right. Uh so yeah. uh thank you so much Harlan um and thanks everybody. I can see there's a few people have had to go but thanks so much everybody for uh, for coming along today. All right well thanks so much for being such a rad audience and um, yeah. Um the introduction to the book is for free on academia.edu if you want to just like get a small snippet, you can go there. So.